All right, let's go ahead and get going. I want to welcome everybody to the University of Colorado Research and Innovation Conference. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to start by introducing the first of our two speakers, Dr. Sarah Fobble. Uh, Dr. Fobble is a professor of medicine in the Department of Renal Diseases and Hypertension. She did her internship in Detroit before becoming a resident and fellow uh, and having a very illustrious faculty career here at the University of Colorado. Her research has has been focused on the effort to clarify the systemic effects of acute kidney injury in order to identify targets to reduce its associated very high mortality. Uh, her current research portfolio includes studies in both patients as well as murine models. Uh, she has been impressively continuously funded uh, since her time as a nephrology fellow. She currently is funded through an NHLBI R01 and NIDDK R21, some private grant support, as well as several NIH and VHA awards on which she is the mentor. Uh, locally, she's also the founding member and senior advisor for the Pediatric Kidney Injury and Disease Stewardship Program. She is also uh, the founding uh, and founder and director of the Multidisciplinary Translational Research and AKI Collaborative, the MTRAC. Uh, and in addition to her work, uh, she is a master clinician as well as a master educator at both the UME and GME levels. Uh, pleasure to welcome Dr. Fabel. Thanks, Dr. Connors, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to present this topic today. Um, I think that this uh, project is probably the most uh, physician scientist -y project I've done so far, and I'm excited to present on systemic inflammation, the liver, and the acute phase response in a clinically relevant mirroring model of pre-renal azotemia. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you, when you saw this title said, huh, because unless you've been in my brain or my lab for the past 10 years, it shouldn't be obvious to put these things together. So I'm gonna start with the end um, and really just discuss on this slide, our overall hypothesis and aims for this particular project. Basically the hypothesis is that pre-renal azotemia will increase plasma IL-6 and trigger production of acute phase proteins in the liver in a clinically relevant murine model. So the first aim is to develop a clinically relevant murine model. The second aim is to look at the effects of prerenal azotemia on hepatic gene expression and the role of IL-6. And the last aim is to de determine the effect of prerenal azotemia on the production of selected hepatic derived proteins. So the novelty and expected impact is that Right now, pre-renal azotemia is thought to be benign, inert, and without consequences. And no model of pre-renal azotemia using the gold standard definition currently exists. This will be the first study to examine systemic inflammation during pre-renal azotemia, the first study to examine hepatic effects. And the expected impact is that hopefully tools to distinguish pre-renal azotemia from acute tubular injury will be identified. Renal function might need to be considered when interpreting certain labs, and there'll be a paradigm change in recognition that pre-renal azotemia has remote consequences. And for future directions, the short and long-term renal remote consequences of pre-renal azotemia might be clarified. So this is my background. I'm gonna talk a little bit about AKI, IL-6, AKI biomarkers, uh, why we thought studying all of this made sense, our preliminary data, and I'm hoping to have time for your questions and input. And I guess I have to have a trigger warning here. Um, I will be mentioning COVID in order to illustrate some of the effects of IL-6 in this talk. So AKI, what is it? It is the sudden loss of kidney function, which I think you all know, but it's important to keep in mind that acute kidney injury, formerly known as acute renal failure, is defined by changes in markers of kidney function, irrespective of etiology. And obviously determining the cause of AKI is fundamental to providing appropriate care. So this is um, how we determine the cause of AKI. Uh, we just gave this talk to the medical students and whether you've been doing it, this for an hour or for several decades, we always think of AKI as being pre-renal, intrinsic or post-renal. And most of what we're trying to figure out is pre-renal disease from tubular injury, uh, acute tubular injury. And so I'm gonna use the terms pre-renal azotemia and acute tubular injury. Uh, in the remainder of this talk, um, they have two different, they have multiple different names. 
And again, we teach our med students um, and fellows and everyone we can come into uh, contact with that these are sort of divided based on urinalysis. And we typically think of the urine sodium and these other changes as describing pre-renal azotemia versus acute tubular injury. But I think you all know that um, once you get under the wards, it's not a perfect distinction between the two. So let's define these real quickly. So pre-renal azotemia is considered to be a decline in kidney function in which no or minimal intrinsic damage to the kidney has occurred. And it's due to a reduction in renal perfusion. Presentation in lab tests may be similar to tubular injury, although urine sodium is traditionally considered to be low. So the gold standard definition that I'm not sure everyone is aware of is that the gold standard definition is a return to kidney function to normal 24 to 72 hours after restoration of hemodynamics. That means that the diagnosis can only be made in retrospect versus acute tubular injury, which is a decline in kidney function that is associated with structural damage to the tubules of the kidneys and is due to a wide variety of insults such as hypoperfusion, ischemia, nephrotoxins. Presentation in lab tests, again, may be similar to pre-renal disease, although urine sodium is traditionally considered to be high and generally considered to be present if supportive measures fail after 24 to 72 hours. The gold standard is kidney biopsy, which is rarely performed. And the bottom line basically is pre-renal azotemia is universally considered to be benign. Acute tubular injury is considered to be bad. And so this is a major clinical dilemma. And the most important point on this slide is the bottom one here. Based on the number of hospitalizations for AKI that occurs per year, which is about 2.7 million. Since about 65 to 75% of AKI is either due to pre-renal azotemia or acute tubular injury, that means the cause of AKI is uncertain for approximately 2 million patients annually at the time of AKI diagnosis. And we know this disease is associated with increased mortality. So IL-6. IL-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's released and elevated with pretty much any sort of stress. And I actually have a reference for this difficult math, math test. You know about COVID and sepsis. If you have A stress plus AKI, IL-6 is even higher. And it's increased in AKI due to increased production, um, which is renal and non-renal and impaired elimination. You all know this, IL-6 mediates the hepatic acute phase response and induces the hepatic expression of virtually all positive acute phase proteins, including hepcidin, CRP, ferritin, haptoglobin, and NGAL. You may not know NGAL, um, but this is a protein that's made by the liver uh, as part of the acute phase response. Um, and you think about your patients uh, with COVID who had these really massive CRPs that happen you know, immediately, but then IL-6 also inhibits hepatic production of virtually all the negative phase, acute phase proteins like albumin. And so as all, I, you know, when COVID was intellectually interesting way back when, you know, I created this worksheet and it was really amazing. The patients would come in, their CRPs, all these acute phase reactants would be really high. And in about five days after admission, their albumin was around 1.7. So those are all effects of IL-6. And basically this acute phase response is the normal response to injuries that prepares the body for battling infection, uh, wound repair, things like that. And the idea is that these types of proteins are all good in iron sequestration. So no iron, no food for bacteria, which is good for you if you're infected. Um, and actually this is just well known established. Even Wikipedia has a page on the hepatic acute phase proteins. So now we're gonna talk about AKI biomarkers. The AKI biomarkers started around 2005 and was originally intended to diagnose acute kidney injury early. And these were all studied irrespective of AKI etiology. So in patients that included a mix of people with pre-renal azotemia, maybe obstruction, maybe acute tubular necrosis. But then later on, many of these biomarkers were thought to be useful only to diagnose tubular injury, 
which has been studied a lot in animal models, but only cursory attention has been given to the study of these tubular injury models in biomark in preclinical models of PRA, prerenal azotemia. So the idea here is that all these injury biomarkers have been studied in tubular injury models. And because they're changed in tubular injury models, they've been assumed to not change in prerenal azotemia. So this paper came out on the injury, the AKI injury biomarkers. And they, it's kind of funny, they, it was the 23rd conference, they had 23 experts and they came up with 23 biomarkers of AKI that they thought were gonna be useful to help us diagnose tubular injury. And so this is hard to see, but this um, column here is all these biomarkers. This is, says diagnosis of AKI. All these biomarkers are supposed to be useful to diagnose AKI. And they're divided into this main group of damage AKI biomarkers. And so these are the plasma and urine biomarkers that are associated with damage, i.e. associated with tubular injury. And I'll let you just sort of glance at this list and you'll see now why I started thinking about the liver because all of these proteins that are meant to be damage biomarkers of AKI, all of these are known to be made by the liver. It's sort of like if I told you you know, that troponin was actually not made, you know, made in the heart, but was made, you know, in the nose or the liver or something like that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And just if you look at this list, NGAL has been studied in um, tens of thousands of patients and is the only biomarker on this list that's actually being used to, in clinical platforms, to make real-time decisions about patients um, who have presumably tubular injury. So we started looking at that protein NGAL, and this was one of our first studies. So we had this model of ischemic AKI, so tubular injury, and we looked at wild type mice and mice who didn't have IL-6, and then we looked at plasma NGAL. And they had the same degree of AKI as judged by other biomarkers, but the IL-6 deficient mice had massively reduced levels of plasma NGAL. And then we studied this in our bilateral nephrectomy model. So this is a model of no kidneys uh, and no kidney injury to look at the effects of uremia. And so clearly you don't need tubular injury for this biomarker of tubular injury to go up. It seems to be going up just if you have a decrease in GFR. And similarly was, abs was lower in the IL-6 knockout mice. And so basically this previous paradigm regarding tubular injury and in NGAL was that plasma creatinine went up in AKI, kidney NGAL went up, and then that led to an increase in plasma NGAL and an increase in urine NGAL. So that's pretty simple. What we found was that IL-6 actually mediates hepatic production of NGAL, which is the major source of plasma and urine NGAL. And so this is wild type mice and the IL-6 knockout mice showing that AKI is the same. This looks like it's different, but it's so small that the kidney um, RNA of NGAL didn't really change at all. And then of course, IL-6 is going up in our AKI model and obviously doesn't go up in the knockout mice. Liver NGAL is way high. Plasma NGAL is high and reduced in the knockout mice and urine NGAL similarly is reduced in the IL-6 knockout mice. So this is why IL's, uh, NGAL is a biomarker of AKI, the sort of convoluted uh, triggering of IL-6 that then acts at the liver, then you have plasma NGAL, and then it's showing up in the urine. So how important is the liver in the production of NGAL? And so we had these uh, NGAL specific knockout mice where NGAL was specifically knocked out in the liver. And so NGAL is also known as lipocalin too. And so basically the liver can't make NGAL. So when we looked at uh, plasma levels of NGAL in this model, um, you can see that plasma with AKI, 
um, plasma levels of NGAL are spectacularly reduced if the liver can't make NGAL. And similarly, urine levels are also low. So why is uh, NGAL a biomarker of tubular injury? So basically, um, the proximal tubule is this amazing cell that basically resorbs most things that are filtered. And so we hypothesized that urine NGAL would be absent in prerenal azotemia because of normal proximal tubule function that would, would resorb it, but that it would show up in the urine with tubular injury. So we developed these models of prerenal azotemia with furosemide and tubular injury with maleic acid, which is actually a proximal tubule toxin. And we directly measured um, kidney function by measuring glomerular filtration rate. So these two models have the same degree of kidney function. And basically plasma NGAL was increased in both of these models. And if we're right about our hypothesis of where it comes from in a normal proximal tubule, urine NGAL should be low here and should be high here. And that's what we found, that urine NGAL is only high with acute tubular injury. So, you know, rightly you could be asking, so what? You know, NGAL is a marker of tubular injury and yeah, there's this convoluted way that it shows up in the urine, but it still should be a good biomarker of tubular injury. We got a nice publication out of it. Um, these authors, these lovely people in Spain also uh, published the same idea that, um, of how uh, NGAL appears in the urine. And we've um, actually emailed each other to talk about excruciating, how excruciating it was to publish our results. Uh, because when you publish something that's different from what people think, it's sometimes hard to get it published. Anyway, so we were like, well, should we just stop there? But I just couldn't help it. There was one other question that kind of bothered me, um, which is why is plasma NGAL increased with just decreased GFR. And maybe it was because of that, you know, 23 member panel of experts of people who I all respect, you know, report, report this as a um, injury biomarker. So is there injury in this furosemide model? And why is plasma NGAL increased in our model? So going back to our overall hypothesis and aims, um, pre-renal azotemia is gonna increase plasma IL-6 because that's where NGAL seems to come from, um, from the liver, and let's get this going. So believe it or not, there's really not a clinically relevant model of pre-renal azotemia um, to study these effects and to study the difference between these two uh, common causes of AKI. These other models that exist seem pretty uh, cruel, withhold water from mice for 72 hours, um, measure these endpoints, but they're not, recovery isn't commonly assessed. So we decided to look at the gold standard definition of prerenal azotemia, which is the return of kidney function to baseline within 24 to 72 hours. And we use the gold standard measurement of kidney function, which is uh, transcutaneous GFR, actually measuring GFR. And so this was our, um, our model, and it's kind of a, a little ICU. Um, so we checked uh, baseline uh, kidney function, weight, and BUN. We gave two doses of furosemide. Then we repeated the GFR and weight and BUN. And then we resuscitated the mice for two days. And sometimes my PRA would be calling, how much fluid do you think I should give? Just like being on call for the patients. And then at 48 hours, we repeated the GFR weight and BUN. And so this is a pretty significant uh, decrease in GFR. So this, it, this worked. We have a model of prerenal azotemia. And then with our resuscitation efforts, um, kidney function returned to more normal within 48 hours. So you can see baseline and recovery are the same. The weight comes back to normal, as does um, our biomarker of kidney function here, which is BUN. And so getting to NGAL and IL-6, we measured plasma IL-6 in this model and it was significantly increased. 
uh, as far as I know, pre-renal azotemia generally isn't considered an inflammatory condition. And then we looked at plasma NGA, which uh, is similar to our previous data, that it's increased in the plasma and not so much increased in the urine. So then we looked at tubular injury. And it doesn't really matter if there's tubular injury or not. This is a clinically relevant model. But it'd be more interesting if there weren't tubular injury since you know, all the effects of AKI that we see, increased mortality, all these other complications are thought to be a result of pure tubular injury. And so we looked at one of these other biomarkers of tubular injury, which is KIM-1, and we found that that was decreased in the urine um, after uh, pre-renal azotemia. So, no, no tubular injury as judged by the urine presence of this biomarker. And then we looked at it um, by immunofluorescence. And so normal is here basic and our positive control is ischemic AKI with this green lighting up here. This is KIM-1 here showing up in the cortex after ischemic AKI, which definitely has tubular injury. And this is the whole kidney slice. So vehicle, no KIM-1, and this is a close up. In our pre-renal azotemia model, there is no lighting up at all of um, this KIM-1 mar marker, and this is a close-up view. So I told you the gold standard for tubular injury is actually histology. So these are normal, happy proximal tubules um, with this happy brush border. This is our positive control for ischemic AKI. You know, everything looks kind of wibbly and broken and weird. This is our vehicle, which is just saline admission, administration. And this is our pre-renal azotemia model. The ATN score in the pre-renal azotemia model was zero. So what about the effect of pre-renal azotemia uh, on IL-6 dependent effects? So we looked at IL-6 knockout mice. Um, we had unmanipulated vehicle uh, and pre-renal azotemia uh, in wild type and IL-6 knockout. And we took out the livers, sent it for RNA-seq, and look to see, are we triggering the hepatic acute phase response with pre-renal azotemia? I'll skip this slide. And so uh, we first looked at, let's see what's happening in the vehicle treated wild type and the vehicle treated pre-renal azotemia. And we wanted to look at what genes are upregulated by pre-renal azotemia. I figured there's like about 20 or 30 acute phase proteins. So I was hoping that there'd be 20 or 30 genes that were upregulated, but there are actually 327 genes that were upregulated just in pre-renal azotemia in the liver. This is our heat map. Um, and this is the pre-renal azotemia group here. And there were genes that were suppressed by pre-renal azotemia, 248. So, almost 600 genes in total were affected in the liver by pre-renal azotemia. And then we did gene ontology analysis. Hopefully you can see it here. The top uh, pathway affected was the acute phase response as we had hypothesis. And this sized, and this doesn't even include um, NGAL in that list, which was one of the most um, highly upregulated uh, genes expressed. So the, now we wanted to look at the IL-6 dependent effects. So we compared wild type pre-renal azotemia with IL-6 knockout pre-renal azotemia um, and looked at genes that were suppressed in the knockout mice and there were 123. But what we really wanted to compare was what were the genes that were upregulated with wild type furosemide and down-regulated in the knockouts. And there were 79 overlapping genes um, that, were, that could be accounted for by the lack of uh, IL-6. And this is our heat map. So this is pre-renal azotemia. This is the IL-6 knockouts. So about a quarter of the genes that were upregulated uh, in the liver uh, were, can be explained by IL-6 activity. And then when we did the gene ontology analysis of those 79 overlapping genes, the top one is the acute phase response again. So just to kind of pick out some interesting ones, we looked at NGAL in the liver, haptoglobin, 
in the liver. And then we looked at hepcidin. And so gene expression was upregulated for NGAL, was upregulated for haptoglobin in our experiment, and hepcidin wasn't. So I just kind of wanted a negative control, something that didn't change. And so these two, um, by just doing qPCR, matched our um, RNA-seq data. And then we looked at protein levels in the plasma. And similarly, haptoglobin and NGAL were massively increased in the plasma after pre-renal azotemia uh, and reduced in the knockouts. Um, and hepcidin didn't change, just to show that not everything changed. So in summary, pre-renal azotemia, unlike what I think we all thought, was is not inert. Uh, an acute decrease in GFR without tubular injury leads to a wide array of systemic effects, IL-6 and over 500 genes affected in the liver. It's not just a mild form of acute tubular injury. At least one of the damaged tubular injury biomarkers, i.e. NGAL, is a functional marker and does not require tubular injury to change. Haptoglobin might be one of several clinically measured proteins which needs to be interpreted in the context of renal function. And overdiuresing patients likely has consequences. So I think if we do detailed phenotyping of this model, we hopefully can get some real tools to distinguish prerenal azotemia from tubular injury. I think we should look at whether complete recovery of fun kidney function actually is associated with complete recovery of kidney function. I think people wonder if maybe there might be longer term effects of an episode of pre-renal azotemia. And since it's associated with increased mortality, investigation of other remote consequences merits investigation. And I wanna thank um, all the folks in my lab, especially Kayo, who has worked really hard during a pandemic and gotten this stuff done. Um, Kevin and Mary uh, are my collaborators who helped with RNA-seq data um, and some other members of the lab. And I look forward to your questions and thoughts. Thanks, Sarah, that was excellent. Um, questions from the audience, please feel free just to unmute yourself and ask questions, although you're welcome to put them in the chat and I'll monitor there as well. We coincidentally have many of your collaborators as well as a lot of hepatologists on here to be our next speaker. Dr. Faba, while we're waiting for questions to come in, what do you think this work means for the other 22 biomarkers? Um, you know, those have been out there for a long time. Some of, you know, they're being added to and taken away from. What is, what do, what do you think this means for that list? Yeah, I think, I don't know. It's not very scientific, but I think we need to look at them all. Um, and then maybe some of them will be, um, you know, taken to clinical platforms a little bit faster if they really are useful in this model to distinguish pre-renal azotemia for, from tubular injury. You know, this has been a long standing area of interest. And I think the data are pretty muddled right now of what tubular injury is and how these biomarkers can really be used. So hopefully we can move this forward a little bit. And while we're waiting for other questions, I'll ask just one more that I've written down, which is, is anyone else using your similar models? Do you've got, as, as you're in one, you developed that model. Did that Spanish group pick that up or has anyone else picked it up that you know of? No, no. Um, there is no model of pre-renal azotemia at, that is well accepted. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like I did at the beginning of my research career that, you know, you want to have a model that can ask and answer questions. And so I feel like this is a good model to kind of look at some of these effects of uh, pre-renal azotemia, which you wouldn't think on the surface is all that biologically interesting. Um, but in the clinical sphere, people are starting to show that even this form of AKI where there is no kidney injury is associated with complications. Uh, and it might be a lot more complicated than we thought. Yeah, the whole idea of just drying people out until their creatinine rises might not be just a marker of dryness. Exactly. Uh, it looks like people are having trouble unmuting, so I apologize. I think it's in webinar form. But the question that's coming in the chat is, 
Uh, do you think looking in cardiorenal, uh, in a cardiorenal model would be a good complement for what you're doing pre-renal for a different reason? Yeah, I think um, the, those models are challenging. Um, so that if you injure the heart first and then you get um, pre-renal, you've got that, uh, the remote effects of ca cardiac ischemia. Um, so I think it's all, I think all these models are worth looking at and thinking about what their strengths and weaknesses might be. Um, but there, there are going to be systemic consequences of, um, techniques to image, uh, to injure the heart in order to, uh, cause, uh, kidney failure at the same time. Thanks Dr. Offer. Appreciate that question. All right, since it's a couple minutes past the half hour, uh, Dr. Fobble, thank you very much for the presentation today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And Dr. Steiner, if you wanna go ahead and share your slides. Sure thing. Give a little introduction while that is coming up. So Dr. Uh, Kaylin Steiner is an assistant professor of medicine here at the University of Colorado in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology. He got his MD degree from the University of Cincinnati, was an intern, uh, resident and fellow uh, at the University of Michigan before being recruited to Colorado in 2021. At Michigan, he worked in the Spence lab, uh, looking at biomimetic systems of human disease, uh, such as human intestinal organized and xenograph models, as well as in the Higgins IBD research group. Uh, and currently, <clears throat> since coming to Colorado, he is in the Steiner lab working on the mucosal inflammation program with Dr. Colgan. Uh, he'll be talking today about modeling intestinal fibrosis, the bench to biopsy and back again. Dr. Steiner. Great. Thanks, Dr. Connors. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about uh, also models. So my, um, my area of interest, my clinical area is inflammatory bowel disease. And my research area is really the cellular and molecular mechanisms of fibrosis in IBD. And so I'm going to be talking to you all today about kind of how we model that and how we can take this from, from the bench to the patient, to the biopsy, and, and then back again. I wanted to start just really quickly. I know we have um, a diverse audience, so a brief intro into inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about intestinal fibrosis and IBD, trying to convince you all why I think this is important to study. And then I'm going to tell you about a bunch of ways that, that we study it. So IBD, this is, um, it's a chronic disease. It's characterized by inflammation in the GI tract. It's relapsing and remitting. And the pathogenesis is really quite complicated. So we know there's an interplay between dysbiosis and the host microbiome or host micro pathogen interactions. There is an autoimmune component and there is a genetic component as well. And a lot of folks are working on trying to figure out all of these intricacies, myself included. It really comes in two main types. So ulcerative colitis as an oversimplification affects the colon only and has really pretty superficial injury. It involves the mucosa and the submucosa. While Crohn's disease can be anywhere. Um, it most commonly affects the right colon and the terminal ileum, but it really can be anywhere from, from mouth to anus. There can be extra intestinal manifestations of these diseases, but primarily these are considered to be intestinal. And a key hallmark uh, of the difference between the two is the transmural injury of the Crohn's disease versus the submucosal and mucosal injury of ulcerative colitis. And so for that reason, when we're talking about intestinal fibrosis, I'm focusing primarily on small bowel disease in Crohn's disease. And the reason being is we can see ulcerative colitis, uh, we can see fibrosis in ulcerative colitis. Clinically, this common, commonly results in kind of a burnt out colon. Um, because it's not trans, transmural, we rarely see strictures in ulcerative colitis. It's more of a patient with long-standing ulcerative colitis, even if it's well-controlled, can kind of have some dysmotility issues in the colon. But in Crohn's disease, this causes strictures throughout the bowel. I'm showing this image here because it's most commonly in the terminal ileum right there at the IC junction or the ileocecal valve. And, um, and it, really more than 50% of patients with Crohn's disease progress to needing a surgery because of stenotic complications. So to kind of quickly look at inflammation versus fibrosis and Crohn's disease, um, as I mentioned, it's, you know, these are inflammatory diseases that are relapsing and remitting. So the red line would be inflammation in a patient and they'll have a bout of inflammation. We can often get this under control. Usually these patients will be well for, for, for a time. They'll have another episode and we'll treat again. But in between this inflammation goes down and endoscopically and histologically, we'll see little to no inflammation in a well-controlled patient. 
But unfortunately, this fibrosis, the fibrotic burden, you know, we think it needs some sort of inflammatory insult to be initiated. But this green line here, you'll see never goes down. So it never really goes away and it just slowly grows. Maybe it gets a little bump with an inflammatory episode. And eventually it's going to progress across this dotted line, which is to represent a clinically relevant fibrosis. So that's going to be an obstruction requiring a surgery or a dilation or a fistulization in the patient. And so this re remains a big problem. I have this um, graph up here. This is, we did this a couple of years ago. It's already grossly outdated. But the point being, these are all drugs for IBD. This is the pipeline with the center being on market phase, um, phase three and then phase two trials. Some of these are now on the market. The point with this though, is that all of these are anti-inflammatory and generally they all target our immune system in one way or another. There are no medications that look at actually the process, uh, that actually treat the process of fibrosis. And that can be said really for any organ. There are two antifibrotics in use in the lung for IPF, but a number of organs face fibrosis as their common, the common end stage for an organ. And there are no antifibrotics um, except for those, those two for the lung. So that's why I find it so important to study. I briefly wanted to give a quick refresher on what intestinal histology looks like normally. And I'll just highlight, we have villi. These are gonna be enterocytes, secretory cells like goblet cells. This is the crypt. This would be the small intestine. So there are stem cells down here, paneth cells. There's a muscularis mucosa layer, a, a, a collagen rich or a connective tissue submucosa, and then a muscularis external layer. And I'm going to show you some of our models later. I'm going to show you what they look like histologically. And so I, I, I bring this picture up just to kind of um, for comparison's sake for later. And again, this is an H and E stain. This would be a normal small intestine. So again, you see these nice villi, nice crypt structures, muscularis mucosa. So currently, our understanding of the pathogenesis of fibrosis in the intestine is um, is, is somewhat limited. Uh, an oversimplification would be to say that there is a, an effector cell that we call the activated myofibroblast. This would be a fibroblast cell that has um, alpha SMA expression. And we think that these cells can come from a number of sources. So in epithelial cells can undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition and become one of these activated myofibroblasts. They can come from resident fibroblast populations. There's a great deal of heterogeneity, even in homeostasis in the fibroblast population in the gut. And so we don't fully understand that. They can come from the bone marrow or the blood and they respond to a number of factors. So they respond to host microbes, they respond to our immune cells, um, they respond to endothelial cells, adipocytes, a number of things. And, and we have a lot of work to do to figure out what's going on here in, in an effort towards developing a targeted therapy that actually treats fibrosis. So on to the different models we use, the different ways that we study this. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about all of these today. So we have the cell culture models and the animal models, and these are really kind of, this is the bench side of things. So this is all, um, all preclinical. But then we have enteroids and human intestinal organoids, which are a big area of interest to me. And that really is representative of how we can take um, not only the knowledge from the bench and apply it to patients, but how we can take patient biopsies and clinical data and and feed it back into the bench to really create, a, you know, kind of hopefully a cohesive and a, and a synergistic system here. Um, and that's where the title of the talk comes from, from the bench to the biopsy and back. So starting with cell culture models, these are, um, you know, in reductionist, uh, reductionist systems by design. So one of the main ones we use is a human colonic myofibroblast monoculture. These are, there's a commercially available line, it's called 18 COs, we use these very frequently. And if you give these TGF beta one in the media, they will become fibrotic. Also, if you plate them on plastic as compared to a soft collagen pad and 4.3 kilopascals is about the stiffness of the, human, of the human bowel. So if you plate them on a physiologically soft substrate compared to plastic, they will become fibrotic on the plastic. And that kind of goes towards the mechanical self-propagating piece to the fibrosis. So once you start to get stiff, the tissue is gonna self-propagate and it can really form this this, uh, this bad spiral. And when I say fibrosis, when I'm talking about preclinical in vitro, what do I mean? Typically we have a, a suite of genes we look at. So this is typically just quantitative PCR. We'll look at things like collagen one, myosin light chain kinase, acta two is the gene of alpha SMA or alpha smooth muscle actin, which is that marker of activated fibroblasts, fibronectin one, and then we do simple, you know, Western blotting and these sorts of things to look at upregulation of genes. And, we know that these models work pretty well and we can use target antifibrotic um, 
therapy, therapies or gene knockouts, knockdowns to study fibrosis in that way. But again, that's reductionist. So um, to take it one step further, we are in development of some co-culture systems to look at this. And um, more and more, some of our, our work is showing that there's a really important crosstalk that goes on between the epithelium and the, and the mesenchymal cells or the fibroblasts. And so in this system, this is your standard well, and this here would be a membrane. So it's softer than plastic and it has pores in it. And we can choose the pore size, but we'll typically choose a pore size that is um, about you know, 0. 0.4 microns, or we can even go up to as big as four microns, but it allows for substances to pass between the cells, but not cell migration. And if you go and plate an enterocyte um, cell line on here, we use a clonic enterocyte called TD4s, and you effectively have two chambers here, and you have a luminal side and you have a basal side. Then we can go and plate myofibroblasts with fibroblasts on the bottom here, and we can introduce various perturbations to homeostasis to both sides or just the luminal side or just the basal side and see how those cells interact with each other. So those are kind of some of the in vitro cell lines. There are a few animal models I wanted to just um, mention today. So the two standard animal models are mouse salmonella model and rat TMBS model. And in these, you effectively create inflammation or an inflammatory insult by giving pathogenic salmonella to a mouse. You clear out the infection after a certain amount of days and they'll develop a fibrosis that smolders. And you can use that to study fibrosis. And in the rat TNBS colitis, it's simply an enema. And you can see here, this is the colon of a TNBS mouse, um, chronic compared to acute compared to control. And this is it's a little hard to appreciate, but this will be a heavier tissue. Fibrotic tissue is heavier, but it's denser, it's shriveled, and it's stiff. One model that we're working on kind of in development is using a, a pretty special kind of mouse called a TNF delta ARE mouse. TNF alpha is a very important part of inflammatory bowel disease. And our first um, anti-inflammatories are actually, we're actually anti, uh, biologics, I should say, we're actually um, anti-TNF uh, alpha antibodies. And so uh, a mouse was generated uh, by a different group that the mRNA of the TNF alpha is lacking or has a mutation in the poly A tail. So it's not degraded as readily in the cytoplasm and this shunts towards production of TNF alpha. And so these mice have been studied really extensively in inflammation and in Crohn's disease or in, as, a, as an IBD model. Uh, but to my knowledge, not anyone has looked at this for fibrosis. And so one of the projects we're working on now is actually aging these mice out. If you age them out to 30 weeks, and they don't always make it that long, but if you can age them out to 30 weeks, um, we're starting to see some signature of a, of a fibrotic change there in addition to the inflammation. And so here what I'm showing on the top is a wild type animal. And you can see that nice thin organized submucosal layer. And in the Delta ARE, you can see that it's thicker, the collagen's distorted, and there's a lot of immune cell infiltrate there. And if you measure these, and this experiment was done with four animals in each group, um, there is a statistical increase in the thickness in the 30 week mice. When we compare this to 12 week mice, which is would be a fairly standard age to study inflammation in these animals. We actually see a significant increase in the thickness compared to those animals as well. And the next thing that uh, we did was we looked at some qPCR uh, gene expression in these. And so this is obviously not an unbiased approach. We haven't done bulk yet, but this is a, a targeted qPCR and things like TGF beta one, collagen one A one, MYLK, which is myosin like gene kinase, and Axel all of which are profibrotic genes, they show an increase in the TNF delta ARE mice. And then the last thing that I wanted to show on these mice was we did do some stains for collagen. So this is Picoserius red, which is a, is a really good stain for collagen. It's a little hard to see the tissue orientation, but I've labeled the lumen and the serosa and in this piece, it kind of curves around here. But you can see in the wild type animal, the collagen is very well organized and it forms this nice line. And it's just really distorted and you know appears non-functional in the 30 week animal. So we're definitely seeing dysregulation of collagen deposition and disorganization of that layer. And that's also a hallmark of fibrosis. So moving on from our preclinical models, we have some exciting human tissue-based uh, models that, that I'm interested in studying and I was going to touch on. So these are enteroids and human intestinal organoids. And the differences um, are somewhat subtle. Um, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, but basically if we can use human tissue to develop more 
biologically relevant, biologically relevant, you know, models, I call them biomimetic models, then hopefully that can help us get to the bottom of what's really causing this fibrosis and, and help develop some therapies for it. So um, there are really, like I said, two different forms of, of organoids, and one I call human intestinal organoid and the other is an enteroid. It can also be called a colonoid if it's from the colon or a gastroid if it's from the stomach or an esophagoid if it's from the esophagus, and I think you get the idea. But um, the main differences are that human intestinal organoids are gonna be derived from a pluripotent stem cell. And this can come from either a blastocyst, and that would be an embryonic stem cell, but we can also take a resident fibroblast from an adult from skin or blood or, or most tissues and actually reprogram that cell to become pluripotent. We then drive that using specific growth factors and growth conditions into to form these gut spheroids, we call them, and they bud off into the well. We collect those and plate them on something called major gel. And these will develop into what we call an intestinal organoid. And this is depicted here. Um, the other way that we can grow enteroids or organoids will be taking them from resident stem cells and from a patient. And so these are gonna be multipotent stem cells, but they are not pluripotent. And the result is we can get this really nice epithelial structure, but it lacks a mesenchyme. So it does not have fibroblasts associated with it. It does not have a stromal compartment. It is just an epithelial compartment. I'm gonna talk about that a little more in the next slide, but what these look like, the enteroids are have these kind of thin structures. This is a true lumen. You can see some shedding, some cells have been shed into the lumen there. And then this is gonna be in what an organoid looks like. So it has not only this lumen and the epithelial layer here, but there's also this mesenchyme or the stromal compartment. So the patient-derived enteroids, these are outstanding models for epithelial biology. They form, they'll form a barrier. We can study stem cell function with them. The host pathogen interaction um, can be studied with these. You can actually micro inject the lumen of them. And one of the big benefits of these is they're gonna carry any genetic alterations of your source. And so this, we can take these, from, we can take samples just from an endos endoscopic biopsy from a patient and grow them into enteroids. But they are gonna be limited, especially for my interest for fibrosis by not having a mesonite. And so that's where the PSC-derived organoids have some benefits. You can also study the host pathogen interaction. Um, this is really, these are really um, common in developmental biology labs. People study organ development and looking for tissue engineering. But I really like that you can study tissue interactions with these because you have two components. So you have this mesenchyme component and the epithelial component. So one thing we've done with these is just like you can give the myofibroblast TGF beta, you can actually give these TGF beta one. It's gonna increase these, um, these uh, profibrotic genes and protein expression. And then we can take this and start interrogating different pathways and different therapeutics. And one of the pathways we've identified is uh, the axle pathway I mentioned very briefly earlier, but this is how we identified it using this model. But um, there is one step further that we can take these. And this is, um, I consider this an in vivo model. And so this is really a human tissue in vivo model of, of the intestine. And so what we do is we take these organoids, once they've grown large enough and matured in vitro, and you can use any vascular bed on an immune deficient mouse. These are NSG mice that we use. They're not true skid, but for all intents and purposes, these are skid mice. And we transplant them onto the vascular bed that is on the kidney. And so we actually just expose the kidney and transplant them right underneath the kidney capsule. You can also transplant these onto the omentum of the animal. And if you leave them for eight to 10 weeks, you can see that these things grow quite large. And so this is now our organoid, and this is the kidney of the animal. And this is just one other picture to kind of give you an idea of how large these are, or they can grow. But here's the kidney of the mouse, and here is one of our organoids that we've done an experiment with. So these really undergo a pretty remarkable maturation process when we do this. On the left is the in vitro organoid. So this is simply taken out of the major gel and stained with immunofluorescence. ECAD is ECAD here, and that's going to show us our epithelial cells. And then SM22 is for staining smooth muscle. This is that mesenchyme or that stromal component that I mentioned, but you can see it's really not organized. It's just kind of a, a, a glob of mesenchyme cells. And these epithelium, you know, they start to look like intestinal epithelium. Maybe, you know, that almost looks like a, a villus-like structure, but if you look, that's actually just a cell that's kind of extending and maybe even extruding. 
But after it's been inside the animal for eight to 10 weeks, this is what they look like. And so I, I'll um, hopefully conjure the image of the prior histology of what a normal intestine looks like. And this is pretty close. So we have these nice villi, we have these nice crypt structures, a muscularis external layer forms, the submucosal layer uh, organizes and layers in a physiological fashion. There's a muscularis externa. You can see these little vacuoles, this is goblet cells. So you really get an array of cell types and pretty, pretty realistic um, architecture. This is a trichome stain of the same thing. So I think if I didn't tell you this was a, an organoid, um, it'd be hard to tell the difference between whether or not we're looking at mouse intestine here or, or an organoid. Um, the reason I said mouse is because it's a little smaller, but this is pretty much what histology looks like for, for, for human intestine. So the last step to this is I want to study fibrosis. So how am I going to use this model and this technology to study fibrosis? I'm just going to tell you about one way in which we've done this. Um, we took the organoids and at the, at the level of the stem cell, we, we introduced a tetracycline inducible TGF beta. And so I won't go into all the details, but essentially we use plasmids and we transduce the two plasmid system into these, whereby when we give them doxycycline, they upregulate expression of TGF beta. And we tested this at both the stem cell level and then at the HIO in vitro level. And then we transplanted these into the mice. We let them mature for um, eight to 10 weeks. We induced TGF beta by giving the animals doxycycline in the food and chow. And we did a 10 day and a 20 day time course. So we're still getting in the process of uh, process, uh, going through that data, but, um, or those data, but the, the short story is a fraction of them did develop a fibrotic phenotype, but not all of them. So there's something more to the story than just TGF beta. And we have an ongoing experiment now where once the enteroid or the organoid is thought to be matured, we irradiate the kidney of the animal to induce an, an inflammatory insult, while at the same time upregulating TGF beta. And we're working on harvesting those tissues now. So hopefully we'll get a little more high fidelity uh, induction of fibrosis in that animal. But really just to kind of summary the next steps, um, you know, this goes back to that bench to biopsy piece. So we have this, this really cool model. Um, I'm working on developing a more robust model of fibrosis specifically, but we've got some great tissue models of, of human intestine. We can apply those insights to the clinic, but also this is an endoscopic image of, of a terminal ileum, um, and we got biopsies of the uninflamed and the inflamed areas here, and then you can take that and do a lot of fancy stuff with it. So you can do next generation sequencing. This is actually a blot of a single nuclear sequencing that we did on that tissue, uh, fluorescence in situ, and then we can generate enteroids out of them. Some of the things I'm working on are how can I get a co-culture of an enteroid from a patient with mesenchyme so that we can get that cross time. And then one other potentially cool application of this I just wanted to mention, because I think it's really exciting, is um, these enteroids have a potential to have, uh, for personalized medicine application. And so high throughput testing of these is difficult. It's a fairly expensive and labor intensive process. Uh, but a lot of groups are working on how do we take a patient derived enteroid, create a high throughput system where we can take a patient at diagnosis of IBD, get a biopsy, feed it into the system and to figure, figure out what they're likely to respond to therapeutically. Because right now um, we have some good epidemiological data about how patients with IBD respond to various therapies, but a lot of it still just comes down to kind of a uh, clinician taking a bit of a guess, an educated guess. And so this is one potential future application for this that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. So, um, I have innumerable people to thank, um, both at the University of Michigan, where I was in Jason Spence's lab and Peter Higgins' lab, and also here, where I just have some outstanding support and mentorship, including um, Sean Colgan and Peter Dempsey. Um, and I just put this picture on here because this is the first time my organoids ever loved me back. So I, I, I like that picture. But, um, so that's all I got. Um, Thanks, I, Dr. Steiner. Yeah. If you're organized to love you back, absolutely. Just, just once, just one of just them. At least once. <laughs> uh, your uh one of your mentors dr colgan uh, has a question do any of the snips associated with ibd ultimately predict fibrosis so no not that not that we have seen um so the nod the nod card mutations are that's a really well recognized genetic predictor of ibd in general and particularly it can it can predict a progression of phenotype in crohn's disease so it can predict um 
essentially progression from an inflammatory only phenotype into like a stricturing penetrating disease phenotype. Nobody has done really rigorous vetting of a, of a, of a SNP or a, um, or a genetic mutation toward fibrosis specifically. So no, no one has looked at that, but the problem is fibrosis clinically is actually quite hard to diagnose and distinguish from inflammation alone. And so, um, that's one thing that I think that these models have potential to unlock here, because we can really specifically start looking at what, it, what, what mutations or what changes might be causing fibrosis as opposed to just, oh, well, this, these people with this SNP are developing a more severe phenotype. And it's really hard to parse that out clinically. What is fibrosis versus, versus something else? Well, we have further questions coming in. I had, I had one question for you, which was uh, you sort of demonstrated that the organoids that you create look like they have the intestinal structures that mimic uh, a, a normal colon or, or other similar organ. What do we know about how they function? Do they, do they act like normal tissue? So by and large, we, we, we think that they do. However, doing a functional assay is kind of um, on the horizon for these. We, you can demonstrate by looking at genetic expression um, and genetic markers and cell markers, we can de demonstrate a, a pretty physiologic distribution of cell type. Um, we have goblet cells that are actually secreting mucus. Uh, we have stem cells that are actually replenishing the villi. Uh, as far as the stromal layer goes, that's, no one has really interrogated that specifically. And that's kind of part of what I'm doing here is by, uh, or want to do is, is look and see how that stromal compartment responds to various stimuli. There, there is a, I'm sure some people in the audience have picked up on it, there is a clear weakness in this model, and that is the lack of an immune system. And so that's also on the horizon here. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting. When we look at these under histology, you'll actually see neutrophils in these. And I don't know those, I don't know if those are murine neutrophils that are infiltrating, but you don't have, you know, the robust, the macrophage, the T cell compartment. So it still is quite reductionist in that regard. There are some folks that have looked at doing bone marrow transplants in the skid mice. So they've actually ablated the skid mouse's marrow, um, transplanted human marrow into the animal, and then it effectively has a human immune system. But that's, you know, again, that's very complicated and complex. I haven't done that, but I'd like to do that at some point in the future. But we need to get an immune component in here to really interrogate, to take it to the next level. Um, the other thing that would be difficult to do a functional assay is that stool is not actually moving through these, you know, so it's isolated luminal structures within the kidney capsule. And so that would be a difficult assay to do, but, you know, there are some ways we could do that. We could take them out and then maybe plate them as a monoculture and then expose luminal contents to various, you know, various substances. But um, it's, I would still characterize it as early days for these. And um, so your, your, your question and your point are well taken. I think we have a ways to go before we can do some real robust functional analysis. I think we have one minute left. Is it a somewhat clinical question for you? You know, profenadone and nintendinib um, started out at an IPF and then it moved to other fibrotic, inflammatory fibrotic diseases in the lung and they seem to have some effect. Do we know if they do anything in the GI tract? Has it been tried and not worked or just is it in the unstudied category? So preclinically, it has been tried and not worked. And so it's kind of hit a dead end. Um, and not just those medications, but also kind of their mechanism or their belief mechanism, because we don't really know how profenadone works even, but people have looked at um, like costocycline inhibition and these sorts of things, and it hasn't really panned out in the intestine to show any sort of antifibrotic effect. Got it, thank you. Well, I think we're right at one o'clock and I don't think we have any questions left. So uh, Dr. Steiner, thank you very much. Dr. Fobel as well. Uh, appreciate you being here at conference today. Thank you, thanks everyone.